Hi, everyone. Good morning. Such a pleasure to be here for the second time this conference, taking the opportunity to thank Barry Elite and Vidak and all of you, of course, to be here today. So let me introduce our panelists today. Um, I will read their titles because I'm not sure uh, by heart. So Mark Leeds, it's the partner of Meyer Brown, uh, tax lawyer. I'm sure you guys have like a, a big background and I will ask each of you to speak a little bit in the beginning. I will only um, introduce the roles today. So David Duong is the head of uh, institutional research at Coinbase. And um, Robert Matarazzi is the CEO of Luca. So um, today we're going to talk about the importance of data and uh, all the strategies behind of using data and blockchain. And I'm sure our panelists will bring a lot of insights um, about how they're dealing with uh, the new regulations. Uh, on one side, about the privacy regulations like uh, GDPR and all the privacy data that we need to take care of from our customers before uh, ha holding their, uh, ha having their transactions in the blockchain. And on the other side, um, and not uh, less important, is the cybersecurity regulations that are coming into force. We've recently had the SEC enacting one um, robust piece of regulation in June this year that went into force in September. So um, I'm sure you guys are taking a close look on that and how to implement these rules, um, all the forms that need to be uh, 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 sent to the SEC, I guess, by December this year uh, with some uh, gracious period until like, six months from, from December. So, um, and that's one side. And, and then it's not only SEC, the, the whole world. So uh, you guys see that I'm not from the US. Uh, I'm from the Latin America, from Brazil. Uh, we are also having a new authority there, new regulations around one side privacy and the other side cybersecurity, but all related to how we handle data, uh, not only in the blockchain environment, but especially in the blockchain environment of, because of its uh, nature, right? Um, and also, we had here in New York very recently, I think I, I saw it last week, last Friday, I think it was really, really recent, that the New York Department of Financial Services all, also revealed its uh, cybersecurity rules. Um, it, it's one of the leading industry uh, a piece of regulation in terms of uh, defining incidents and defining how the, 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 the firms have to respond. So this rule is applicable for everyone that it's uh, dealing banks, crypto firms, uh, brokers that are dealing in New York. And this rule was uh, also revised. Um, I think the SEC might had drink uh, had drunk in this source of the New York uh, Department of Financial Services because this is one of the more robust regulations in the world in terms of cybersecurity. So, um, and so, given that right, that we have on the one side the data privacy regulation and the other side the cybersecurity regulations, uh, we are uh, taking the opportunity in this panel to see how strategically these firms here that are leading firms in their, um, in their uh, 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 markets are dealing uh, not only with applying this regulation and in terms of legal and compliance, but also how they are thinking strategically to leverage on this you know, high standards of regulation and how we can help our clients to also take insights from this, right? Because the regulation is not only there, to for uh, for to be there, there is a, a main reason, which is f f on the one side protection, and the other side because we actually need uh, to take care and use this data in a strategic and smart way to be able to leverage this and also uh, provide our clients uh, strategic insights. So with that, I think I will start with you, David. Um, so, so you are the, the, the current head of institutional research. So I'm sure you handle with a lot of data and uh, also uh, help our client, your clients to use it in your, uh, you know, your day to day. So tell me a little bit um, how you manage to, you know, leverage uh, all this, uh, this, this new regulations that are coming into force and how you help clients to better leverage data on the blockchain. Yeah, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for having me here. You know, so 
I would argue that it's pretty challenging in the space. So I used to work in emerging markets research, and you know the question that we get more often in the crypto community that I didn't get when I was back in EM was, are there fundamentals in crypto? And that's not to argue that you know there are not anchors inside of crypto, but it's much harder because of the volume and variety of data that we have available here that a lot of people kind of say, listen, I, I know you've been around for 15 years, but you know, like what really can I actually anchor on? Like, in, you know, I used to do rates, for example, I used to do FX. Well, you know, you had interest rate differentials, you had inflation uh, on those asset classes. What do you do in crypto? And we often use frameworks that we've applied elsewhere. So people often take a fundamental equity view, try to apply it into crypto. And to some degrees, they work. But those analogs aren't perfect because this is, in fact, a very different asset class. For example, let's take two different things. One is Uniswap and one is Ethereum. Hopefully everyone in the crowd might be familiar with what these two different things are. One is the decentralized exchange, Uniswap, and one is the actual platform on which that exchange runs, Ethereum. Ethereum is basically akin to the World Wide Web. It's effectively saying, how, what would I pay for access to the internet today? Like we don't have to do that because as you know, the internet is free, but we pay for the services on that, the applications on that platform, right? The internet has your Amazon, your Facebooks, your Googles, and to varying degrees, you either pay with real money or you pay with your data. Uh, well, Ethereum is basically that. How do you value that? How do you value that access? It's probably worth a lot because can you imagine if you didn't have that in your lives today, well, go back to 1995, and you could probably imagine it very easily because at that time, people were criticizing, well, what do I need to replace uh, my, my radio with a podcast? Why do I need to replace my TV with YouTube? Um, these things are easy to imagine today, but back then, people were all saying very skeptical things about it. So this is what's hard about data in, this, in the crypto industry because within each of these kind of sectors and platforms, they all rely on different sets of data. So it's not the fact that the data itself isn't ubiquitous. We have a lot of things. We have on-chain data, we have transaction data, things that sent, sit on centralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges, the transactions of what people are broadcasting across a decentralized exchange and saying, I wanna buy or sell this. Everyone is aware and familiar with it. So you can actually go and, actually, and, and decide what is relevant and what's not. The problem is with so much data, what do you do? And that's where I think the, the big challenge is inside of crypto. Even within a certain element, say something that we have something called total value locked, which says how much is actually, how much money, real dollars, is sitting on a platform right now. But what is the makeup of that? Is it actually converted into straight up dollars, i.e. stable coins? Or is it a token that maybe I'm a little bit more skeptical about. So that composition really matters and you need to kind of differentiate it on a case-to-case -case basis. Got it. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And also like um, th that's the, the thing that, that that's never uh, like a, a bulletproof solution that it's always evolving and always uh, uh, um, having your applica applications, right? Um, so, uh, um, Robert, as the CEO of Luca, um, which is a soft, t tell us a little bit about Luca before, sure. and then I uh, will start it. Yeah, so, we're a data company, and we have a, um, several different types of data products that solve different pieces of either data management or, or we offer data products um, as a service. So, pricing data, qualitative data, security master related data. And then our software manages all of the data that was that was really just mentioned because it's a it's a lot more data than we would tr traditionally have to interact with, and it's been um, accumulating over over a decade really without any standard setters involved. So it makes it very tricky to make the data usable. And so we've developed an expertise in in making all of this crypto transaction pricing and other data usable across all of our different products. Right. So so how you were seeing. Um, does uh, the the blockchain and this use of robust data in your in your market uh, disrupting the financial markets and how you you see it's uh, like evolving in this uh, scenario? Yeah. So um, as 
as David mentioned, there's there's a lot of different data to use, and a lot of what we're used to relying on in traditional markets just simply isn't doesn't exist, or there's there's too many options. Um, for example, determining fair market value for an actively traded crypto asset is is very tricky. We developed one response to that problem that we call Luca Prime. Um, Coinbase is a customer of it. They also have their own data. Most people that don't know data intimately don't understand that relationship. You know, Coinbase as a, a large publicly traded centralized exchange requires different types of data in order to operate its business. And sometimes their own pricing data isn't necessarily the only solution that, that they need to rely on, um, just to give one, one example. And now we start mixing DEXs, uh, on-chain data, off-chain data, collecting it, normalizing it becomes very, very challenging. And it's become very relevant in all the ETF or index creations that we're seeing out there. And as we're, uh, as we're seeing them create it, we have to solve problems that uh, people aren't used to solving before. For example, out of all the centralized exchanges, which one represents a principal market? And we can, we can determine uh, fair market value from their prices. And that's, that's very tricky in, in a decentralized ecosystem where there are no formally established principal markets, just to give one, one example of a problem that we solve today with our uh, our products. Right. And, and it makes sense. And I, I'm going to go to you, Mark, but I just want to have this uh, thing bridge from uh, your speech to ask uh, David about your institutional clients and financial institutions, how they um, they are um, handling this um, in this crypto space. And do you have any uh, insights that what they're handling in terms of like to find better liquidity, uh, price, transparency, and, and, and things like that using uh, Coinbase? I mean, definitely having order book dynamics, for example, are very helpful for people. I mean, if you're a trader, for example, this is your core of what you need, right? You need data on volumes, you need data on market depth. To varying degrees, this exists. You can actually access it. There are third-party vendors who provide it. Uh, so I think that for our clients, certainly the asset class has seen a drain in liquidity that's not altogether you know, different from what we've seen in traditional markets, right? A lot of this has to do with what's going out in the world in terms of central banks actually tightening uh, their own balance sheets and uh, actually trickling down and affecting pretty much almost all asset classes. But as a result, you know, we are seeing a lot more, um, you know, What's the word? Uh, more companies kind of like trying to aggregate this. They, they, they because ag I would say, correct. Sorry exactly. to interrupt, but in the financial market, traditional market, you have like Bloomberg, you have like that terminals that give you all the information aggregated. So right. you're saying that the tools are coming more into the space and helping. The tools the client. are definitely coming into the space, but also like more liquidity is sitting on like fewer places, which is actually leaving market depth untouched. So market depth has actually been fairly decent which means price discovery is actually also doing very well. But yes, as far as the tools themselves, they are also like broadening out very rapidly. I mean, in the last two years alone, I would say the number of platforms where you can actually access this stuff uh, is you know, ubiquitous. But the challenge is that it's, there, there's so many vendors in a lot of ways that you're kind of saying, like you're, you're kind of trying to figure out who offers you the most in terms of getting not just the uh, centralized exchange data, for example, like the, the trading data, but also the on-chain data itself, because you really need the combination of both to really make a real investment decision. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to you, Mark, um, a little bit on tax and reporting, which is uh, also very important in this, this uh, data uh, and blockchain space. Um, so uh, what are the prospects of the passage of the substantive rule and the reporting rules when, uh, and when we should expect those rules to be effective? Well, the most important thing to know is that in the past month, the Internal Revenue Service, in response to a demand from Congress, has proposed reporting rules for cryptocurrency and other digital assets that are uh, 
incredibly comprehensive, that they um, will move us from a situation where we've had no reporting whatsoever to essentially putting um, each of the uh, digital exchanges um, into a position where beginning in 2025, they're going to have to report price data, basis data, and all the information regarding their customers. The rules that came out were almost to be honest, laughable in terms of how comprehensive they were and in such a short period of time in which uh, the re exchanges have to uh, comply. And there's pieces of the legislation which require data from 2023 to be kept and then used for reporting in 2025 and years thereafter. The Internal Revenue Service itself, I think it's fair to say when they came out with these rules, understood the magnitude and the watershed of change that they represented. And it looked like we were going to have a situation that replicated ones in prior years where the Internal Revenue Service came out with these very hard deadlines and then the goalposts kept getting moved further and further back. When it looked like that was about to happen, Congress actually for the first time has stepped in and they said not only do we not want these rules postponed, we think that 2025 may be too late that we enacted, we enacted the mandate for the rules for 2023, and we really didn't give the Internal Revenue Service the right to postpone the rules. And what it's going to do is it's going to either force a significant number of exchanges to stop taking U.S. customers, or stop taking U.S. customers that are acting from within the United States and can be traced back right. here, or they're going to result in these mini exchanges that get formed in the United States because the larger exchanges won't have the ability to comply within the period of time that's uh, being uh, proposed by these by the by the rules just to put it out there it's over 300 pages single spaced yeah and it, and it seems like uh, the exchanges are leaving the US not only for tax reasons but uh, also regulatory but um, good to know that it's also a threat in this regard um, so uh, still with you mark tell tell us a little bit about um, if you can share an overview of how the IRS believes that cryptocurrencies should be taxed Oh, okay. Um, there have been a significant amount of uncertainty as to the taxation of crypto transactions, and crypto transactions can offer significant tax benefits. Probably two of the biggest issues we have, um, the first one is what we refer to as wash sales. In other words, trying to accelerate losses to be able to use against capital gains. And there's a series of rules inside the United States tax code um, that say that if you sell a uh, security Security, and then within an, a 90-day period, be beginning 45 days before and ending 45 days after the sale, you reestablish the position that the loss is, becomes unavailable and the, the amount of the loss simply gets added to the basis of the newly acquired property. The wash sale rules clearly do not apply to crypto, and the Congress, uh, in a report, came out and acknowledged as much, which creates substantial opportunities for banking losses in the crypto space and those losses aren't necessarily limited to crypto assets so if there are if you have security trading gains or other types of trading gains and you have substantial positions in cryptos you can trip the losses in the crypto assets and then use those losses against other types of gains that you may have which is a significant benefit especially given the volatility um, that crypto has experienced lately um, and then there's um, uh, the creation of funds uh, that trade in crypto and whether or not they can accept non-U.S. investors. One of the big issues um, around uh, crypto funds is whether or not the trading of crypto with a U.S. asset manager uh, creates a nexus for foreign limited partners. Um, in the report, the IRS came out and uh, said that they were unsure about whether or not that trading safe harbor would apply in that circumstance. On the other hand, uh, the, the reservations appear to be, I'm going to say, not really uh, too great because uh, in the same breath in which they said that there was uh, some uncertainty, they quoted enough of the factors that would support 
the conclusion that uh, creating a crypto fund and having non-U.S. investors admitted directly or using a feeder structure would protect would be protected by the statute. Uh, a third issue, which is really important for crypto investors, um, is the ability to use mark-to-market -market accounting for tax purposes. And it looks like, uh, with respect to the vast majority of assets that a crypto trader would be trading, that mark-to-market -market would be available. With respect to some less liquid um, uh, tokens, that uh, would not be uh, maybe not the right answer. So it may be a mixed bag on mark to market. I see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that uh, lesson. It's very important to know. Um, I think I will drive a little bit to data protection and privacy. Um, so, so, so um, Luca not only handles the like delivers data to clients, but also handles uh, clients' data, right? But primarily transaction data, I think, which is where you're going with this when you're when you're dealing with PII or any personal identifying information. Um, there's a lot more rules, a lot more things that you have to do, and you have to make sure that you're treating that data properly. For the vast majority of our services today, we do not have to interact with it. Okay. We're usually interacting with an anonymized customer ID. Um, so, for example, if we're supporting Coinbase with their information reporting, then we would use an anonymized ID, perform our services, clean up the data, quantify it so that it can fit into all the tax reporting on a very large scale because they have an immense amount of data. And... Um, and then actually not interact with the privacy data deliberately because we don't need to, which is a okay. best practice. If you don't, if you don't need your vendor to interact with privacy data, you should you should not, and you should avoid that um, if you can. And um, and that that is part of the good news with a lot of uh, a lot of the reporting when we're doing it B two B. When you're doing direct to consumers, of course, uh, your business like Coinbase, you you have to interact with it a lot. So right, yeah, and and then when it comes. When it comes to privacy in blockchain, uh, we are still like developing solutions like uh, zero proof knowledge and uh, digital identity solutions. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys want to talk to this a little bit or is it something that it's uh, not actually related to your day to day, uh, like uh, in terms of uh, figuring out what's coming in terms of uh, privacy solutions for blockchain? I mean, I, I think it's relevant from a user perspective. And I think that these technologies, I mean, they're relevant to me because I research them. Right, because right. I think that the future of blockchain technology will encompass account abstraction and ZK knowledge proofs, probably some element of fully homomorphic encryption. And these are phrases that seem really abstract or, or obscure to you. They, they, they are, because even in computer science, uh, these are technologies that really are on the forefront of these kind of developments. But what do they do? Effectively, let's just take on take them piece by piece. Account abstraction, fully uh, ZK rollup, or Z zero, zero knowledge proofs. So the idea behind them is right now to interact with a blockchain, it takes a lot. If you're a user, for example, you need to have some degree, some understanding about how to, to how to get on there. You kind of need to have some of these uh, these assets, these digital assets in your wallet before you can interact with them. You have to have a wallet before you can interact with them. So the idea behind this is what if using a blockchain was just like using the internet. Changing that user experience is very significant. And when it comes to privacy, a lot of times, let's say healthcare, let's say other things online, like you're worried about where your data is going. Like what if I need to interact with something? What if I need to kind of prove who I am? Let's say I have I, you know, an, I, I, uh, your driver's license, your ID, your passport, but you don't really trust the source that you're kind of giving it to. Zero knowledge is a way of obscuring that so that the person has the information they need without all the underlying data that's kept private. That is the experience, that's the user experience that we're trying to move towards, which actually shows the real use case behind blockchain technology that's very different from the existing internet 2.0 that you are, we're all familiar with. So like this is kind of where we're going when we're talking about privacy enablement on blockchains. Very nice. Thank you, David. Yeah, that's something I think that's very interesting. And uh, again, like the other part, it's uh, it's evolving and probably a month from now we're going to be here. And and, and uh, we are seeing uh, in Brazil, for instance, the CBDC project going on. And the main challenge is actually the privacy issue, how to, you know, cover and not uh, show information that the government doesn't want to have. So it's still... Because it's a centralized entity. I mean, this is the thing. Like, People say, well, no, my data is private right now. 
it is to the company that you gave it to. That company still has all of your data. They also then cannot share it with anyone else. But the benefit of having ZK enablement is that you could actually port that data from place to place and it will always stay private. And you are not stuck with one provider because you don't want to give all your information to a new provider. No, you can actually move that very easily. You can always prove who you are. And that's a problem, you know, like a lot of a question I get asked very often is like, well, once CBDC has come in, like won't stable coins just go away? No, because there is no privacy issue with stable coins when there is a huge one with CBDCs. Perfect, yeah. And also I like to, to think of that on how the, 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 the sovereign of the data to the person, right? The person ha in, gets empowered to have it, your own data in this new uh, digital identity world that we are getting there. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. So as I put in the beginning, I said this like kind of two-folded uh, goal of the same thing, which is like... A, using the be the best ways use of data for the person and uh and the institution is in handling it so the other part of that is this the how we are seeing hackers and frauds improving in the uh, 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 enlarging in the in the environment as much as we are seeing new tags and new softwares coming into place um it's not that the hackers are not being able to uh, uh, walk with us in kind of the same uh, speed that we develop tools, right? So, as and also we saw you know new rules coming into place. So I wanted to listen to you, uh, maybe you both, and of course Mark, if you want to complement this to uh, how you are um, in your organizations improving your cybersecurity policies and dealing with all this. Uh, increase of uh, frauds and hackers and, and cyber attacks. And I'm happy to start if, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's never ending and, and any company that exists in 2023 needs to be constantly combating cyber attacks. I mean, it's it's a bit ridiculous. And I think in a post pandemic world that that um, exacerbated it even, even more, honestly, there's just more people sitting in front of computers, I assume. And, um, and there's a lot of opportunity for theft um, digitally. So it's very important. It all starts with, with risk management and, and things that businesses have had to do for a while. We might have to continue to do it in more innovative ways. Um, but uh, but old-fashioned risk governance inside of your organization um, is, uh, is the beginning of what, what leads to a mature cybersecurity or infosec program. And, uh, and I think all types of businesses need to manage this. I mean, even my own personal information, it's, it's almost a, a joke how many times my social security number and date of birth has been part of a breach um, from so many different businesses. I don't even consider it PII or, or private at all anymore. Um, but a lot of other data is, and it's very important that we, you know, that we have proper safeguards in place. Thank you. Uh, David, do you have any comment on that? I, I think... You 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 are not the person who deal with that part in your organization, right? You have the compliance guys, the IT guys. Um, yeah, that's that's true. Um, so um, I think I will uh, move back to tax. Uh, Mark, do you have um, uh, um, like uh, any any comment that you want to talk to us about all this uh, yeah. thing that you see in the tax part and reporting? Actually. A comment that Robert made a little bit earlier I found really interesting because Robert says, we have anonymized data. We can't see uh, who the clients are. The way that the current tax rules are written, they actually address that. And they will no longer permit uh, someone who's going to otherwise be treated as a broker from uh, not complying with the reporting requirements based on the fact that they haven't obtained the data if they otherwise meet a broker. These rules have uh, are proposed to really have teeth and broker-to-broker -broker transactions, which are generally exempt in the securities area, are not going to be exempt in the crypto area. And the so, weef, the, the uh, DeFi wallet uh, categorization is a VASP, I believe, is the uh, one of the aspect of that. Right, that that uh, sorry to interrupt, but that. Uh, Adds a lot of complexities for those that aren't aren't aware. Essentially, a hot wallet provider also has the same information reporting requirements as a centralized exchange. Uh, maybe to give you a lead in as how how hard that is though to do. 
Right. The only ones, the only uh, wallet providers who are going to be exempt from reporting are ones who can't do gross proceeds, can't track gross proceeds. So active wallet providers, um, hosted wallet providers are going to be um, required to report as well. That's not to say that any given business couldn't restructure itself. Um, in a way, or provide data in, in a way that um, would exempt it from the requirements. But um, the previous ability to rely on the fact that I just haven't received client data um, is specifically cited by the IRS in the report as no longer being a basis for uh, not reporting on a go-forward basis. Uh, but that would obviously require some degree of, of change of business model. So I think that that's um, a really important um, uh, change that's going to affect a significant number of people. The definition of broker, unfortunately, contained in these regulations is so sweeping uh, that actually Congress had commented after it enacted the legislation itself and begged the Internal Revenue Service not to interpret the rule in the way that they had written it. Um, <laughs> because that they hadn't an, an anticipated quite so broad a reading. The Internal Revenue Service actually responded in these regulations and said, no way, we're following the words of the statute, and we have an extremely broad definition of who's going to be treated as a broker, including DAOs, um, which there is actually, there's very, could e easily be said there's no there there. There's no centralized person to undertake the reporting. So DAOs could very well be subject to information reporting as well. I think the, the one piece of good news from these proposed regulations is that the list of exempt uh, recipients that, or ex exempt transaction participants uh, follows the existing rule. So non-U.S. persons won't be subject to reporting. U.S. corporations won't be subject to reporting. Financial institutions are not subject to reporting. So it's pretty, pretty clear that what they're getting at are individuals who are transacting in crypto or, in, or uh, directly or through partnership structures that are um, have the opportunity, because of the lack of current reporting, to avoid um, reporting themselves. They're just, they're the, the statistics that they've been relying on suggest that it's less than 7% who report anything. And of that 7%, only they're not confident that those people are reporting accurately. So they're trying to capture the 93% of, of people transacting in crypto who they don't think are reporting anything at all and fix the reporting on the 7% that are actually reporting something. But, you know, unfortunately for business, the Internal Revenue Service um, or the government uh, doesn't care what it costs because if it costs five dollars for them to collect a dollar, well, it's not their five dollars, right? So every dollar they get more than they had gotten before is a win, regardless of the fact that the cost of compliance may well exceed um, the amount of revenue that's raised. It's a question or not be possible at all in, yeah. in for certain businesses, right? Which I think is, I'm optimistic that hopefully that definition will be narrowed. Yeah before the compliance date, because honestly, there's a lot of businesses that either just simply won't be able to comply, won't be able to afford it. Um, there's all kinds of technical reasons, and I'm kind of contradicting our, our own revenue at Luca. We support information, so information reporting for enterprises. Um, so that's more revenue for us, but when we're working with our partners, if they just simply can't, then there, there isn't a path forward, and it, it doesn't really support any of the objectives. That, that's that, that's unfortunately very very true. Yeah. So um, I think my last question, taking to this point, and uh, to David uh, that knows everything about the institutional players into the crypto space, do you think this lack of clar uh, clarity, not only in the regulatory space but also for the tax reporting uh, requirements uh, and definitions, does this part also scare? scary the, your clients to the crypto world or you'll see them having a good uh, amount of comfort in the zone? So the way I would characterize this is there is an adoption curve, right? I would say that for most people, if it looks kind of like this, for example, and I'm not doing a great job of this because I don't have a board and I'm using my hand, uh, but most people don't necessarily want to be on the front part of the curve because that's scary because that's where the most uncertainty is, probably where you get the most upside, but you take a lot of risk for that. And as investors, it's always not just about the reward, it's about the risk that you're taking. So a lot of people don't want to be at the end, because by that point, 
all the alpha might be gone at that point. You want to be in that middle part of the curve. I would say that we are, we are gradually moving into that middle part of the curve right now. And that's a place where I think a lot of institutional investors are actually very, not say happy, but looking forward to kind of being on. The issue right now is that they're looking to each of their peers and saying, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, like they, they, want, they, don't, they don't want to be the first mover, per se, yeah. but they definitely want to be there to capitalize on that change because this is what regulatory clarity looks like. It's not clean. It's not pretty. You don't get, like, tax rules that you, that you, that you want immediately. These things take time. But if you are in the place where the sausage is getting made, this is where a lot of the most money is getting is going to be had as well. Sounds good. Well, I saw that we have less than five minutes and we wrap this panel up. Um, it was a challenging uh, job to uh, put all these broad aspects together. So if I miss anything that you guys want to just compliment and the message that you want to leave with the audience today, please, we have our final minutes. Sure, I'd just say that in, in the spirit of, of data and this this topic, we uh, um, any businesses that are just starting to adopt it, I think most in the audience seem like they're they're very well underway, but don't underestimate the the challenges or the importance of clean, clean, reliable data at the end of the day, and that's it's it's very tricky. Um, and when it comes to the information reporting requirements like we're seeing, hopefully it evolves for the better. But regardless, it's a very short timeline to even start complying um, if, if you start today, which I know is what we're telling all of our customers as well with, with all the partners that support that. Right, thank you. I'd also, I'd just like to point out, um, I've left a couple of white papers that my firm has prepared um, on the bar in the back. So if anyone's more interested in the tax topic and uh, you're not otherwise seeing it in the Luca library, um, uh, you're welcome to take copies of the white paper. Thank you, Mark. Um, the only thing I would leave you with is I moved in the space from traditional finance because I thought that the how much data would actually be out there would actually make my job easier. It's, it's going to be quite the opposite. But I will say this has been one of the funnest challenges I've had in my career. Good. Yeah, I think I, I agree with this part, too. Um, OK, um, I think we have like two minutes from any question from the audience. Anyone is curious to know anything from our panelists? Okay, so I think I I'll call it uh, a panel. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.